In this module on the vascular diseases of the retina, we will be covering certain important vascular diseases in terms of the concepts of their management which later on can overflow to all the other vascular diseases of the retina. These few topics which we are covering are important clinically and have a higher incidence in our patient population. We start with the most important part of the whole discussion that is the examination of the retina and diagnostics in retinal disease. This knowledge of this particular topic will overflow later into each and every topic and will be applied to each and every condition that we study. The retinal examination uh, is something different from the routine ophthalmic examination that you might have come across in clinical practice. It does require an array of lenses and lens systems to see different extents and different parts of the retina. The commonest method is with the help of a slit lamp biomicroscope using fundus biomicroscopy lenses which consist of the 78, the 90 and the 60D which allow us for a stereoscopic view of the posterior pole, the disc, the retina till the mid periphery. The D in these cases as we have seen in the slide here, they stand for the dioptric power of the lens. The larger the dioptric power, the larger is the field of view and the lesser is the magnification. So for an example, the 60D will give you the highest magnification but the least field of view, whereas the 90D will give you a larger field of view but the least magnification. The second method is the indirect ophthalmoscope with 20 and 30D lenses. As we have seen, this D as it starts for the dioptric power. The larger the lens, the smaller the dioptric power, the 90D lens is the smallest whereas the 20D is the largest among the group which we have discussed till now. In this case, for the indirect ophthalmoscopy, the same logic applies. The 20D lens will give us a higher magnification but a lesser field as compared to the 30D whereas the 30D will give us a larger field of view. The 30D specifically is used for examination of pediatric eyes to screen eyes of retinopathy of prematurity. This test of indirect ophthalmoscopy is having limited use without the use of scleral indentation. The scleral indentation is used along with the indirect ophthalmoscopy to see the extreme periphery of the retina in cases especially of vascular disease and retinal detachments. Additional investigations which are very very important and act as in some cases as diagnostic tools are fundus florus and angiography that is especially for diabetes and vascular occlusions. Electrophysiology which consists of the electroretinogram and the electrooculogram alone or in combination with the FFA especially for the diagnosis of abiotrophy of the retina and Amsler grid charts which are the charts used for testing the macular function. As we have decided as a routine in all the topics we start with the clinical anatomy and the applied physiology which will help us in understanding the pathological processes which will be detailed henceforth. As we know the retina consists of 10 layers from the pigment epithelium to the internal limiting membrane from without inwards. The clinically relevant to diabetic disease or vascular diseases are the outer plexiform and the inner nuclear layer where the location of the deep capillary network lies and the nerve fiber layer where the superficial network is situated. Being vascular diseases these affect these particular networks and the changes are mostly seen at these two levels. The changes related to diabetic eye disease are related to the location of the blood vessels as diabetes essentially is a microangiopathy. Being a microangiopathy, capillary networks are the targets of the disease and hence the changes are seen in them. These capillary networks are lined by endothelial cells. These endothelial cells constitute the blood retinal barrier. One of the important blood retinal barriers which when broken can lead to a lot of fluid accumulation in the third compartment and the signs of retinal disease. The changes that are pathognomonic in case of diabetic eye disease however are the microaneurysms or the vascular anomalies of the capillaries, hard exudates which are due to the leakage of lipid and protein from the damaged endothelium as we have already discussed, dot and blot hemorrhages which are deep seated and flame shaped hemorrhages which are superficial and flame shaped as they lie along the plane of the nerve fiber layer. Uh, IRMA or the intraretinal microvascular anomalies and cotton wool spots. Cotton wool spots essentially represent the infarcts of the nerve fibers and these however being present in diabetes but they are not pathognomonic to the disease. All are essentially an effect of ischemic capillaropathy that is the bottom line of diabetic changes. Clinical pathological correlation, this is a very important flowchart which will help us understanding all the vascular diseases of the retina and we will be referring back to this chart at every stage or it is recommended to refer back to this chart at every stage in understanding the disease and simplifying it for the examination as well as the clinical purpose.
all the changes of diabetes or any uh, vascular abnormality start with a microangiopathy especially in this case of diabetes this microangiopathy can lead to a capillary leakage a capillary closure or a capillary dilatation now this capillary dilatation due to localized endothelial problems can lead to microaneurysms which is a fundamental in diabetic eye disease due to a pericyte loss it can also lead to a capillary closure because of the occlusion of the lumen of the capillary this can lead to ischemia ischemia can lead to a capillary non perfusion elaboration of vascular endothelial growth factors which can later lead to neovascularization the location of this neovascularization depends on the location of the site of ischemia and it can be at the disc it can be on the retina the iris and the angle depending on the extent of the ischemia and the etiology of the disease as a result of this neovascularization which is basically a lot of abnormal blood vessels with an abnormal lining the extremely leaky nature of this can lead to a vitreous hemorrhage this the fibrous component that comes along with these blood vessels later on can contract and give, give rise to tractional retinal detachment and the fibrovascular proliferation itself can cause a lot of tractional changes in the retina this if it involutes can lead to a burnout disease or if it doesn't can lead out to formation of neovascular glaucoma this the microangiopathy also can lead to a capillary leakage this capillary leakage can lead to hard exudates and hemorrhages now out of all these three the capillary closure and the capillary leakage are common to all the diseases or all the vascular diseases of the retina that cause a vascular compromise however the microaneurysms are very specific only to diabetes the central pathway as we said is common to all the occlusive disorders of the retina like the crvo or the central retinal vein occlusion the branch vein occlusion to various processes like hypertension sickle cell disease hypercoagulable states as we stated i'm repeating again microaneurysms are the only pathological change characteristic of diabetic eye we come to the classification of the diabetic eye disease many classifications have been put forth the most common and the accepted one and relevant today clinically is the etdrs classification which stands for the early treatment of diabetic retinopathy study this disease is classified by in this classification into a non proliferative and a proliferative disease the non proliferative disease is again classified into mild moderate and severe depending upon the area of involvement by the changes which have been enlisted previously proliferative disease is classified into early and high risk types out of which the high risk mandates urgent treatment to avoid the complications mentioned in the flow chart this intervention in high risk category can be in various forms in the form of retinal laser in form of surgery intravitreal injections or a combination of above in a random sequence important terminologies to be remembered as far as the diabetic eye disease is concerned as a clinician and more so from the point of view of examinations which needs to be revised repeatedly is the entire etdrs classification the definition of clinically significant macular edema the definition of proliferative diabetic retinopathy and non proliferative diabetic retinopathy however we should remember here that duration of the disease in the human body is the most important risk factor for development of diabetic retinopathy the other comorbidities like hypertension and addictions like smoking also dictate the presence of the disease earlier than that is required timing of examination in cases of diabetic patients is very very important as they present to us as a physician in the first for the first line of treatment in cases of non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus the examination needs to be done immediately at diagnosis the reason being that we are not sure how long the disease has been there in the body and as duration is the risk factor for developing a retinopathy the age at presentation is the first time when you see the patient as contrast to that in insulin dependent diabetes mellitus the changes the patient presentation is at an early age the changes take some more time to occur and hence the examination of insulin dependent diabetic cases should be at least within the first 5 years of diagnosis now insulin dependent cases however have a more chance of developing a proliferative retinopathy as compared to the non insulin dependent ones which can go in more for macular pathologies like macular edema it is very important for us in these cases to remember the causes for decrease in vision in case of diabetic eyes the most important being macular edema followed by vitreous hemorrhage tractional and combined retinal detachments and ischemia of the macula 
Coming to the treatment modalities that are present to us for diabetic eye disease, they depend on the presentation and the stage of the disease. When the patient presents to us, the patient on the, exa on the basis of his fundus examination is classified according to the ETDRS classification into the various stages. Depending upon the regular indications for treatment, the therapy is absolutely necessary for the high risk type. The early proliferative retinopathy and the severe non-proliferative retinopathy can be treated if the patients will be lost to follow up or if there are additional risk factors. Pharmacotherapy of diabetic eye disease is the bottom line. The treatment of retinopathy is not a substitute for controlling the disease. The disease has to be controlled before any sort of therapy can be started and glycemic control is the first step for treatment of any diabetic eye disease also. Strict control of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, anemia, nephropathy and hypercoagulability of associated is mandatory because that will help us give a better result with the laser treatment. Topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs will help us treat the macular edema. In the second modality of treatment for diabetic retinopathy is intravital injections of antivascular endothelial growth factors. These chemicals are, have been discovered lately in the last decade and they are responsible for very very drastic or dramatic changes in the course of the disease especially the neovascular component. These essentially constitute a group of drugs called the monoclonal antibodies the examples of which being bevacizumab, commonly called Evastin, and ranibizumab, commonly called Lucentis. Both these drugs are routinely used for the treatment of uh, diabetic eye disease, out of which the Lucentis or the ranibizumab is the only FDA approved drug for the same. Apart from these two, intravitreal injection of steroids like triamcinolone acetonide in a non preserved uh, formulation can be used alone or in combination depending on the indication for the treatment. Laser photocoagulation with argon green laser or the frequency doubled neodymium YAG laser which is a solid state laser with a frequency of 532 nanometers has been the gold standard for treatment of diabetic retinopathy over a few years. Argon green laser however measuring 514 nanometers wavelength is rarely being used nowadays because it is a gas laser and there are problems with its maintenance. Retinal surgery is used for non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage, one-eyed patient with vitreous hemorrhage, tractional retinal detachment involving the macula or a combination of the above. It is also used in cases of vitreomacular traction leading to a non-resolving macular edema which is not amenable to treatment with the other modalities. In case the media is hazy due to any cause, peripheral retinal cryotherapy is one of the last options but because of advances in vitreoretinal surgery, this option is very infrequently utilized as vitrectomy is usually done before this stage occurs. Treatment as we said is generally preceded by the control of systemic disease especially the nephropathy if it is associated with comorbidities and the treatment is guided essentially by means of a fundus fluorescein angiography. Angiography in short is the study of the vascularity of the retina obtained from photographs on a camera that is a fundus camera after injection of a contrast in the anticubital vein or any peripheral vein of the body. The important fact to be noted here is that every stage of the angiogram gives us plenty of information which leads us to the proper diagnosis and identification of the treatment pattern of the particular patient. The most important finding in fluorescein angiography is the areas of capillary non-perfusion and neovascularization which can be detected better than any clinical examination because a wider field and a static view can be obtained at one time. These areas of capillary non-perfusion or CNP and the areas of leakage are identified if any. Depending on the presence of each, the disease can be classified again. In some cases, the clinical disease needs to be reclassified based on the angiography and as the changes appear much more than what they were seen on the retinal examination. These and then the treatment proceeds as per the ETDRS classification and as per the modalities selected by the retinal surgeon. Coming to the laser photocoagulation in short, the laser photocoagulation is a process which, is be, which will be common to all the modalities of treatment which we will be offering to different retinal vascular conditions. It is important to know a bit of detail in terms of clinical knowledge as well as in terms of the examination. We have already discussed that the laser photocoagulation is done with the help of a photocoagulator which can have different types of delivery systems. The photocoagulator essentially consists of a neodymium YAG delivery unit having 532 nanometers that is being used recently 
with a slit lamp or an indirect ophthalmoscopic or an endolaser delivery. This also uses special laser lenses by the name of Mainster, Quadrospheric and Area Centralis in addition to the delivery system in, uh, when delivered with the help of a slit lamp. The types of treatment done are alone or in combination are depend on the angiographic findings and the clinical findings and are divided as follows. The laser treatment that treats the whole retina or panretinal photocoagulation is usually done for high risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy and conventionally in three sessions each consisting of 500 to 700 burns that are applied one burn width apart 500 microns per burn done this is done with the intention of rendering the hypoxic retina ischemic and preventing the elaboration of the damaging vascular endothelial growth factor which can lead to all the complications that have been mentioned subsequently in the flowchart treating this kind of hypoxic retina prevents the elaboration further elaboration of this factor and hence helps in the regression of the retinopathy focal photocoagulation is used for selective treatments of points of leakage as seen clinically or on angiography. In combination with panretinal uh, treatment, focal treatment is always done in the first session as aggressive panretinal treatment can worsen the macular edema. The grid laser is basically a pa pattern of treatment that is applied to the macula when the leakage are ill-defined and there is diffuse leakage of the capillary bed. The, this modality of treatment is particularly used when leakage points cannot be individually identified by means of an angiogram. The spot size in these cases changes to 100 to 200 microns and decreases as you proceed towards the center of the fovea and is applied usually within the vascular arcade. Hence repeating the most important point that photocoagulation is the modality of treatment for all ischemic, teleangiectatic, neovascular conditions of the retina and not only for diabetic eye disease. So it is very very important for us to remember these details and repeat them every time we do a laser photocoagulation for any, pro any process.